All right, if you're anything like me, you hate running out of food on a trip. It's like a big fear, and so I'm I'm a big fan of snacks during an adventure, and one of my absolute favorite go-to snacks are wonderful pistachios. You may be familiar with pistachios and the brand Wonderful Pistachios, but if you're not, they are one of the highest protein nuts out there. One ounce serving of Wonderful Pistachios is six grams of protein. That's 10% of your daily value. It also includes nine essential amino acids, and they come with a ton of different flavors, varieties. There's a spicy version. There's lightly salted. There's no salted. There's so many, and every time I go on an adventure, i not even lying, I take an entire bag with me. And what's cool, too, I love having the Wonderful pistachio in shell because then that almost gives me something to do and focus on as I'm paddling or biking through the really monotonous parts of the adventure. Every great adventure is going to have plenty of boring moments and it's nice to have something to do and also something that is giving you some fuel like wonderful pistachios. So they're one of my favorite adventure snacks, favorite road trip snacks, and definitely leave me feeling better than a lot of other snacks you can turn to. So if you want to learn more about how to fuel your next adventure with wonderful pistachios, go to wonderful pistachios.com to learn more. I love a good deal as much as the next person, but I'm not going to crawl through a bed of hot coals just to save a few bucks. It has to be relatively easy. No hoops, no BS. So when Mint Mobile said it was easy to get wireless for $15 a month with the purchase of a three-month plan, I called BS on them. Well, turns out it really is that easy to get wireless for $15 a month. The longest part of the process was the time I spent on hold waiting to break up with my old provider. It is super easy to switch your wireless carrier to Mint Mobile. They got a great website, easy to purchase, get your phone activated. If you're looking to work with Mint Mobile, go to mintmobile.com slash ASP. And you'll see how to sign up for one of their three-month plans that are only $15 a month, including the unlimited plan. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text on the nation's largest 5G network. Find out how easy it is to switch to Mint Mobile and get three months on premium wireless service for $15 a month. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month premium wireless plan for $15 a month, Go to mintmobile.com slash ASP. That's mintmobile.com slash ASP. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent to $15 a month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Speed slower at 40 gigs on unlimited plan. Additional tax fees and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. So, uh, you know, one of the stereotypes when you get older, you start really getting into birds. And it is very true for me. My wife and I are like, is that a cardinal? Is that a mockingbird? A blue jay? Whatever it is, I'm really getting into birds. And what I'm very excited about is the new Feather Snap, which is a Wi-Fi enabled smart bird feeder that blends the best of technology and nature. It's this unique dual bird feeder that helps attract more species with built-in solar panels and keeps your camera battery going strong to charge the camera that's on there. And then it sends it to your phone and also identifies the birds that are going to your feeder. Me and the kids are absolutely loving it. And we've been really surprised by what's come to our bird feeder. Just for transparency, I got my mom a trail camera last year so she could see all the animals in her backyard. And the first night we saw a bear a bear. We didn't even know there were bears. I mean, we knew, but we didn't know they were that close. And this takes it to a whole nother level because it's 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 for people who love birds and want to understand what's in their backyard. And I think it's an awesome gift idea. It's like one of those things a lot of people wouldn't get for themselves, but it's such a cool thing to give people that they can really get excited about. It's the gift that keeps on giving. And it's just, I'm always a huge fan of bringing more of nature in and getting people more excited about you know, the things around them. And uh, as someone who who can't be in the mountains all the time or out on an adventure, this is almost like bringing a little adventure home with you. If you want to learn more about the Feather Snap camera, go to feathersnapcam.com. That's Feather Snap, S-N-A-P, cam, C-A-M.com, uh, where you can learn more about their cameras and open up your own window to the wild.
Hey folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. Uh, today's episode's a little unique. I'm talking to a fellow podcaster, Dave Stewart. He hosts the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. And what I love about his show is it's, you know, unlike this show, which is a show broadly about different adventure sports, uh, Dave is so honed in on fly fishing and he knows it so well uh, that he teaches it. It's a really good way to not only hear the storytelling and hear from fly fishers, uh, but also learn how to do the sport exactly. We don't, we don't really do that on this show, so it's great to highlight Dave. Uh, he runs an amazing operation, and if you're interested, he actually has ways to go fly fishing with him and, and classes to learn how. And In fact, he's made this unique uh, URL, this website post just for this episode uh, that's all about getting started with fly fishing, the best tips from the 600 plus episodes that he's done uh, with this show, Wet Fly Swing. Everything from, you know, what do you have as a beginner to how to choose the right fly rod uh, to which, you know, which things should you purchase? What do you need to worry about later? Uh, different tips and just really getting started in the sport. I know so many uh, folks who supplement their adventure if they're not primarily fisher men or women they supplement their sport with this i know people who bike packed or bike toured and they would fish where they go uh, i do a lot of kayaking and paddle boarding and sometimes i'll bring a fishing pole or the people with me will bring a fishing pole and when we're resting they might just you know have a couple casts out there if it's not a true fishing trip uh, in fact just a couple weeks ago we talked to wildlife pilot Denise Joy, who literally restocks lakes uh, with trout and then goes and fishes those lakes. So she does it for work and for a recreation, which was such a cool, that was an awesome episode. Go back and listen to that if you haven't already. But this episode was great. It's a lot of just uh, talk and shop. He's a fellow podcaster, so we talk a lot about that. Just a great conversation because me being in a fishing heavy area in Florida, I've noticed fly fishing really come up as a way to experience the outdoors, that wasn't the case 10, 15, 20 years ago. It seemed to be relegated to the mountains, and now uh, it seems to be everywhere. So this was a really timely adventure uh, in conversation. I really enjoyed it. So thanks so much, Dave, for coming on. And this was uh, this was a really fun episode. I, I really uh, am eager to get into try out fly fishing again now. I used to do it as a kid and with my dad in the mountains in North Carolina, but not so much recently. Uh, but this is a great way to get back into it. All right, folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. Today's a little bit of a unique episode, as you heard in the intro. Dave and I are going to be ta talking shop a little bit, talking about his story and journey. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of similarities, actually, just because I, I think the timelines are pretty similar. Uh, the amount of episodes is pretty similar. There's a lot uh, of similarities. So, Dave Stewart, welcome to Adventure Sports Podcast. Yeah, thanks, Mason. This is going to be awesome. I've been uh, excited to. I've uh, been looking forward to this one for a while. Yeah, that's awesome. So, wh where are you coming from? Where's home? So, I'm on the coast of Oregon. So, right, like literally, I can hear the ocean out my back door. I'm about two hours due west of Portland, so I could you know drive over the coast range, and I'm in the Portland. But we're on the coast. We're in a tiny little town. Um, you know, barely a thousand people. Oh man, that's my that's my kind of town right there. I love that. Is that where you're from? Uh, well, originally I was from Oregon, just outside of Portland. I mean, I've okay. pretty much been in Oregon, yeah, the whole time. But I've I migrated around the state, and uh, the coast is just, you know, especially when you get these these extreme summers. Man, it's nice to be at the coast when it's 75 degrees over here or whatever, oh, and it's 105 in town. That's awesome. I, I'm on, I'm the exact opposite. I am on, uh, you know, probably similar distance away from the ocean, but over in Florida on the uh, yeah. the gulf side of of the state and so it's a di different kind of coast for sure but lots of fishing here too man lots oh yeah yeah too. no we love florida florida is a hot spot for sure for fly fishing and just yeah any fishing well uh you know i want to hear a little bit about the wet fly swing first of all what is, what is that with tell me the name i'm not a fly yeah fighter. i have fly fished up yep. in the carolinas with my dad but i'm not i'm not into it uh yep. What what is that phrase? So so the wet fly swing is a technique in fly fishing. So when you're, I'm a big steelheader out here. We have a lot of steelhead. That's our one of our species. So it's just basically swinging a fly with a, a with a wet fly across the surface. Mm -hmm. So you basically cast out down. It's a very simple way to cast down and across, and you let it swing across the current, and you just hold on 
basically hold on for dear life until you know for a steelhead to hit it but you know wet fly swing that's all it is you can also swing trout flies but it, essentially it's a technique and so our podcast started out season one was just steelhead just northwest we were super niched but after the first 30 episodes i said you know what i think i want to do all fly fishing i don't want to be just into this tiny niche so we expanded out and now we've done episodes all over the country all over the world you know, like you said, Florida is a hot spot. The East Coast. I do as many trips and episodes on the East Coast as I do the West Coast now. Wow. Yeah, and I saw you were just you. You recently talked to somebody in Honduras. I like it's worldwide. And, and and so now that I have kids, I'm like, okay, no, they need to know how to fish, hunt. So I'm kind of getting back into it now. And and there's a lot that's changed since since I've gotten out of it. One, fly fishing's just way more popular. Like it's just every body of water I see is potentially going to have a fly fisher. Oh yeah. And that was not the case of uh, uh, when I was coming up. It was like only, you know, in the mountain streams and rivers and that that was it. Like that was where the range for fly fishing was. Now it's like out in the bay, out in the lakes, like Everywhere. I I'm actually super curious. I don't know this answer. Why why has it gained popularity? Have people realized, "Oh, we don't actually just have to do it there. It can be anywhere?" What 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 has been that reason? There's been some changes in the technology of products and lines and rods and things, right? So they've made basically any rod or any fish you want to go for, there's a specific line for it now, right? And rod setup. So for example, we just did an episode with uh, Conway Bowman for Mako Sharks off in California, which is like the giant apex predator. And he's catching them on a fly rod. I mean, it's unbelievable. So pretty much, and then also the travel, right? Adventure travel. I mean, it's, it's really in the last... 15, 10, 15, 20 years, it's just expanded. There was always people back in the day doing this stuff. But now, you know, going to uh, South America or even, you know, across the world isn't as hard as it used to be. So I think those two things have come together. And then just maybe it's the social media, maybe it's all of that. But people now realize like, hey, even though these trips might cost $10,000, I mean, people have the money and they're willing to travel across the world to go fish for this one species, right? Whether it's in the middle of Africa you know, I've interviewed guests from all over the world, like you said, on all these topics. But I think it's just that. I think it's gotten easier. The gear is better. It's easier to travel. And then people are realizing like, wow, it's doable. I don't have to just fish for trout, brook trout in my, you know, the Shenandoahs or whatever. I can actually go down to Florida and go for tarpon. You know what I mean? Like tarpon is a huge. I've asked many guests. What is if you had to pick one, some of the biggest fly fishermen in the world? And I said, only one species. What would you go for? And it tarpon seems to come up so often and then florida right i mean you can literally go down to florida and it's one of the greatest places in the world for tarpon so i think i think those things in our coast you know being west coast east coast whatever there's a lot of opportunity for salt you know species to go after out there so i think i think it's just gotten easier and uh, and there's more people talking about it so there's uh you know for okay a mako shark on a fly fishing rod I, yeah. I did not know that so so what are some of those adjustments obviously like a, a heavier line like what, what are some yeah. of those things that that you have to adjust for for catching something like that yeah i mean it's just everything i mean the rod um you know the rod is specific the lines are specific the type you know mako is very unique because i think you know that whole process that you, you, anybody could listen to that episode we can put a link if you want to but it's um there's specific gear for it the rod the line you know and i'll take an example of like um you know, fishing in the uh, jungle, right? You're going down for a Dorado or something like that. I mean, these lines are made for salt. They're made for the warmer temperatures. So when you're casting, if you need to make a long cast, you can actually do it now. We're back in the day. I mean, geez, if you go back in the sixties, they were using bamboo rods and silk, you know, and silk fly lines, right? At some point. So that stuff just doesn't perform right. But now, and then the flies that we use, I mean, some guys like we're going for musky this year, we're going up to uh, Wisconsin, guys are using like 12 inch flies for musky. And so to be able to cast a 12 inch fly, you've got to have a specific rod in line to, <clears throat> to cast those. So that's a big part of it. And, and so everything's gotten very unique. The, the companies are amazing, you know, and so, you know, you still have to learn to cast, you still have to be proficient at casting. But again, you know, if you're, if you're a brand new person, you probably don't want to start with big tarpon, right? You probably want to start with some smaller species, but once you learn to cast and if maybe you get a guide, you can do anything. You can literally catch anything in the world right now. If you get, you know, get the right gear and a guide, probably you could do it. And, it. and was that just not like people just did not realize that? I don't know, 15, 20, 30 years ago, or like were there, there were obviously probably early adopters that, that were breaking out of that. What, what I feel like was that, you know, stream 
style fishing and for trout specifically and and now it just is everywhere who, who, when did this wave start happening yeah i mean it has been a slow progression if you look at it i mean i go back to steelhead for example it's my home species my dad was a steelhead guy back in the day i remember my first you know i grew up around a fly shop i mean back this is mid 70s right so mid 70s people were doing it it's just there weren't that many people he was one I mean, if you go back to the 60s he was the first people, probably one of the first people fishing that river for steelhead back in the 60s, right? 50s, 60s. And, and it's slowly, right? Coming to the 70s, it, it was getting popular. It was increasing. I'm not quite sure what the turning point was on it, but I think it was just this, this piece where, uh, like I said, I think it, things have gotten easier for people. And they were doing it. People were catching tarpon with bamboo fly rods back in the day, right? They were doing all that. It's just that there were only a few people doing it. And now you know, it's just a lot easier. So, so it has been, like you said, people were doing stuff with bamboo rods back in the 50s, 60s, but you know, it's a very small chunk of them. So fly fishing is like, it just has this perception of like a little bit, uh, it's, it's snobby. Like, no, 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 no. I wasn't actually going to say <laughs> no, that. No, it's not you know? snobby. Okay, uh, good. There, there are a couple of these, these, uh, I don't know, perceptions I do want to touch base on, but one of them is like, when you really get in, like when you get into it, you are into it. It's like climbing where I've seen climbers, they, they, they like, they sold everything, anything they can get their hands on to make a dollar for. They are buying climbing gear. They're living in their car in Yosemite Valley. And it's like, holy cow, it's like a drug. Fly fishing almost is that way to me. Like people just get into it so much. So yeah. what what is it about? fly fishing that maybe is different than other styles of fishing are you are you like more in tune with what's going on and with nature it, and also i do see yeah. those people appreciate nature a little bit more than yeah other types of fishing i see yeah i think we we talk about this a lot and first off yeah i mean it, it, fly fishing has changed a lot too in the last whatever 20 30 years right there was a period of time when people were i think it was the old we all joke the old white rich guy right that was it that was the fly angler now it's way more diverse. You know, there's people in the middle of Arizona, right? Downtown, you know, whatever city in Arizona fishing for carp on the spill, right? Fly fishing for carp. I mean, it's like anything. So that's a cool thing. Like anywhere in the country now you can find a fish to, you know, go for. But, you know, it's this, um, but it is this meditative thing, right? I think a lot of people talk about that because the cast is this, you know, River Runs Through. You remember that movie back in the 90s came out? It basically blew up fly fishing. Nobody knew about it. Brad Pitt and the crew made this amazing movie and, and everybody started learning about it. But you remember in that movie, the cast, right? He was doing this crazy cast, but it, you, you get that cast and you get in this rhythm, you know, and it's almost like I kind of have goosebumps now thinking about, it, but you kind of, it is meditative, you know, and you add a fish where you're trying to target this one species. And if you do hook it, you know, and potentially land it, you have this amazing moment. And then a lot of times you release it, you know, and not that we're against killing fish because I'm all for, I love eating fish, but there's a lot of times where, you know, maybe the species, you know, there aren't enough fish to, to kill or whatever, but a lot of it is catch and release. And that's another cool thing. So you're actually leaving this fish to go back into the water and reproduce and, you know, and that whole cycle continues. So I think there's that. And then, you know, I look back at an interview. I've had a number of amazing interviews over the year. I, I interviewed Yvonne Chouinard, right? The phone, uh, founder of Patagonia. And it was this epic interview where I was sitting across from him like this, asking him questions of this billion, you know, billion dollar company. But he's a dirtbagger at the end of the day. You know, that's him. He, he climbing gear, right? He created the company, all these companies in the climbing space. And that's how Patagonia started. And, but he's, a, he's just this passionate guy. And so I feel like, it fly fishing brings in passionate people a lot of times it's people that started fishing with gear and that's great a lot of people still fish with gear i do too you know you know there's nothing wrong with that but i think once you take on fly it, it kind of um i don't know i think it's harder to do in a lot of cases right it's harder to catch a tarpon on the fly so it, it makes you more in tune with it um so but yeah i think ultimately it is more of a meditative experience you know you're outdoors you're you're experiencing that Wow. How was it? Yeah. How was it interviewing y Yvonne Chouinard? And that was uh, not that long ago. That was like a year ago, right? Yeah. It's a year ago. Yeah. It was, uh, it, it was, you know, the guy is unbelievable. You know, I mean, he's basically, if you just look at what he's done with Patagonia, he's given the company away to, I mean, what is their tagline now? We're in business to save our home planet. Like that's the, yeah. actually the official home yeah. planet. That's their official tagline. He's just, that's his mind. You know, I was asking him questions all the time. I had this at the time. I had this R2 fleece on from Patagonia. I was like, oh, dude, I love this fleece. It's so amazing. Like, I stay warm when, it, you know, and he looked at it and he was like, you know what? Do you know how many uh, microfibers come out of fleece when you throw it in the, in the dryer? 
it's you know like the pollution that that comes mm-hmm. from people and he started talking about like we created this new um, dryer with samsung which removes 99 percent of microfibers from the environment right so that's his mind he's always thinking about what can we do next because he realizes you know, I don't like to paint a doomsday ever of where we're at, you know, the climate change and stuff, but there are things we need to do. And I think Patagonia is a good example for a lot of companies that like, Hey, there are things we can do to help, you know, even if it's a small little thing. So that's what I really took home from that interview, even though, again, I'm at times I was sitting across the room realizing, Oh my God, I'm interviewing Yvonne Chenard. This is amazing. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. At Lives In, it's all about making fewer, better things. It's about owning less so you can live more. It's about adventure, finding joy in the day-to-day, and living a well-worn life. And your clothing should support that journey. That's why Lives In has combined technical features, durable construction, and modern styling into functional, versatile outdoor clothing so you can take on everything that the day brings without ever having to change your pants. Go out for coffee in the morning, head to the office for the day, Finish the evening off with a post-work cragging session, all in the same outfit. When you buy Lifson, you buy for life. You can get 10% off being a loyal listener to Adventure Sports Podcast with the code ASP10 at Livesin.com. That's L-I-V-S-N.com. I'm personally a huge fan of the Flex Canvas overalls. I haven't had a great pair of overalls in a while, and I'm actually really surprised by how functional and and, and just useful these are for my day-to-day. I like having that extra almost protection on my chest and around my belt. And I've been doing a lot of house projects lately, and this is just like almost my suit of armor I can put on. Really cool stuff. So I've become a big fan. Gets me in that like workshop mode. And I'm not afraid to wear overalls around town. So again, get 10% off by going to livesin.com, L-I-V-S-N.com, and use the code ASP10 at checkout. Hey folks, I know a lot of y'all love your animals out there. And a lot of us have dogs and cats and horses and everything we love. And a lot of times they start getting older, it's harder for them to be mobile. And some CBD products could really be beneficial to helping them have a really healthy life and helping with that longevity. So today I'm excited to talk about our sponsor Gaia Provides. I have a dog that's around 13 years old. He's having some joint issues and I give him some Gaia Provides chewables. They're small batch, lab tested for quality, designed for pets, dogs, cats, and horses. And the company is very community impact oriented. A portion of every purchase is donated to one of their three partner rescue organizations. And they offer a ton of free resources for pet parents that you can go check out their blog at GaiaProvides.com. My dog is loving the wellness chewables and is helping him with his aging joints have as long of a life and as joyful of a life as possible. So if you're interested in trying Gaia Provides, you can use the code ASP for 20% off GaiaProvides.com, G-A-I-A Provides.com, and use the code ASP at checkout. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. That's unreal. You know, you know what's funny is uh, Chris Tompkins, uh, the partner of, of Doug Tompkins, friend of Yvonne Chouinard, I recently listened to an interview with her on a podcast, and she was like, uh, the 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 uh, interviewer this is ed robertson of mountain and prairie oh, yeah. podcast yep. huge fan and oh, yeah. uh had ed on last year too and nice and, uh, just great and i i've been listening to him since i first discovered podcasts and and he he asked uh, chris you know what was was doug and are doug and yvonne like you know optimists you you often hear that you know in order to change the world and they're like no actually they're kind of pessimistic both of them that's right i I thought that was surprising because of the amount of solutions they're always looking for and the amount of change they're trying to make you know to be to be pessimistic is is almost i don't know a little bit taboo to say that but it's like hey it works for them and they are you know, that that's a perfect example with Yvonne, like, oh, he's not going to yeah. accept this praise. He's going to bring up a problem, but then, the, yeah. but then bring up a solution too. So that's, yeah, exactly. maybe, maybe that's the, the, the trick, but man, what a, what a crazy moment that, that had to feel surreal for you. And, and, and two, Patagonia has done such a good job with fly fishing. That's the one area that they've decided to, you know, break through from just being outdoors. And so, 
it does set fly fishing apart as far as a, a sport than a lot of other uh, sports where the target is getting an animal. And uh, th- that that speaks to me that there is a difference there than other sports. I want, I want, what did you do before this podcast and before uh, pouring your life into this? And, it, and let me ask, is this what you do? Host this show and lead these trips? Yeah, I mean, this is the majority of it. I mean, I definitely have a good chunk of, I mean, 95% of the revenue comes from kind of what we do on the podcast with sponsorship. I do some other stuff in marketing. And I have uh, in, like sponsorship as well. So I'm kind of doing some other things, but the majority of what I do, these travel trips, you know, everything we're doing with our travel program and with our sponsorship, it all comes together, you know, to focus on the web by saying, we also have the school of fishing, which is an educational platform that we're, we're, we're building it out. We have an app coming for that as well. So there's a number of, you know, like anything, there's a number of, you know, revenue streams with the kind of the online stuff, but yeah. And I grew up around, I mean, I grew up around a fly shop, I guess, you know, my dad had was a guide I've guided, you know, pretty much, you know, off and on for a long time, most of my life. I don't, you know, do a lot of it now just because I, I kind of got burned out from it. The guiding is not easy, you know, but the podcast was the thing that really, you know, as I learned about online marketing and things like that, you know, basically my story is, you know, in 2017, um, I already had the blog going and things like that, but I really loved podcasting because I was listening to other podcasts and I was like, oh man, I was listening to Pat Flynn about bit, smart passive income and business stuff. And I just said, a goal. I was like, you know what, I'm going to start a podcast in two years. And I really didn't know what it was going to be like or about, but I set that goal. And then two years later, sure enough, it, it came and I launched this podcast. And the funny thing was when I was working online with the blogging stuff, I didn't really, it wasn't really resonating with anybody. I didn't really enjoy the writing that much. And so I didn't hear from anybody, but as soon as I launched that first episode in 2017, December, somebody reached out to me, like, I think it was that week and said, Dave, this is amazing. You got to keep doing this. You know? And I was like, boom, I was like, that's, I got it. That's it. And so what I've done with a lot of things, you know, I I feel like, you know, a a saying I really think about is invest in yourself, you know, whether that's just your life or business or whatever, but I've been doing that. and, And so I've been, you know, investing in myself, taking programs and coaches and stuff to get to me to a point to understand more about the business podcasting and all this stuff and how it works. And that's how I've done it. And since then it's just been scaling up to a point now where, you know, we've got over 600 episodes. We do three full length interviews a week. I've got a team of, you know, six people. And uh, it's just like, I do the interviews, you know, it goes into our, in our, our queue and then they come out and it's kind of like, you know, I won't say like clockwork because there's always bumps in the road, but that's, that's the system we've kind of put in place. Oh my God. So you got a team doing this. Yeah, small. It's small, but yeah, yeah. small six. That's a lot yeah. for a podcast. Yeah, I do. What, what do they help you with anything else, or is it just the the podcast they focus on? Everything. Yeah, everything. Everything Dude. from um, from sponsorship to uh, outreach. You know, marketing. Pretty much everything. Yeah, that is freaking wild, man. I mean, that, I'm a one man show. I have yeah, I do have that, someone that helps me with social media, but that's it. And I think a lot of you know, and I was too for a while, but I got to a point where you know I wanted to, I wanted just to. to get scale it right i want to do more and and these trips are a good example i couldn't be i couldn't do these trips i'm setting up these programs i couldn't do this on my by myself so we're traveling all over the country you know like i said we're going to wisconsin i'm going to wisconsin for muskie two weeks later we're going to be going to back to the driftless it's a it's a cool thing and it's been a goal for my to, the travel program is something i've had my sights on for a long time and that's been a goal and finally we had this opportunity and, and now we're we're full in on it and we do these events so we do a, a giveaway event every pretty much every month or so so we give away a trip some lucky person wins a trip to these destinations and gear from you know all of our people so it's pretty cool and then we sell trips too for the for the outfitter so we'll sell six to ten trips so then i'll meet up there that's what's cool thing is that we'll go live like in uh you know musky i'm going to meet up with six people who've been listening to the podcast and a winner and it's always fun because the winner is always the X factor. It's like this random person who maybe doesn't <laughs> don't know. know. Fly fish. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's it, awesome. And it's happened that we, we did one in, uh, in Idaho for, for our Euro school and he had never fly fished before. It just shows you how amazing these guides are because he had an amazing trip. I mean, the guy was like, it's one of those things where I think it was night at one morning, he cracked open a beer and he's like, all right, let's go. You know, it's like, one of those things where it's just, it's just a good time. So, so you, you find an outfitter, you know, these outfitters now that you want to work with and you're like, Hey, we're going to book y'all's trips. I'm going to, you know, sell them for you, but I'm going to be a guest there. And then we're going to do a giveaway. So that that's, dude, that's a great system because then you don't have to figure out all the logistics that there's that local knowledge and that local 
you know, know how of, of where to go, what to do. You don't have to just totally lean on yourself to figure all that out. When I was guiding on my, by myself, I hated it because I felt the pressure. So now, you know, there's not as much pressure because I have the best guy because literally I've reached out to our top, whoever the guests we've had on who are the best in the country. I have reached out to them and said, Hey, do you want to do this with us? And then they'll say yes. And then, so now I know I've got the best people in for that specific fishery. And then I just let them take it away. And, and you can focus on like really just having a good time with your, with the people. Like you don't have to do that. Also make sure, you know, the, the van's booked or the food's. Exactly. Cool, well, the heck that is. there is a, there is a little bit of that because we do some of these places don't have lodges. So we're trying to go to a point where it's all lodge focused, but we have done the Airbnb, like folk build our own. And that, that has been work. What were you doing before this? So I've always had some, you know, I mean, like I said, I've always done a bunch of things. I grew up in it, but I mean, I've done some work around, you know, kind of uh, uh, stream kind of restoration and things like that. I mean, I, I, basically, it's always been something I've been doing, right? I've been in this field. Fishing has always been my thing. I mean, literally, I've had kids too, they're 10 and 12, you know, and, and they're actually not as like when I was 12, I was fully into fly fishing, right? I was had all the gear, I was, but they're not quite into it yet, but I'm not worried about that. I think it's just, you know, having kids is great. So we're, we're outdoors, bottom line. So, you know, you, you decided to start the show. Why, why two years? I feel like a year is a lot of time to say, but, but, but you, you completed it on that. Would you have started it a year if you would have said, I'm going to give myself a year? That's a great question. I don't remember why I put two. I think I probably did because I figured, you know, give me enough time. I didn't know enough about podcasting, how to do it mm-hmm, so at mm-hmm. the time. I was learning, like I said, Pat Flynn was a big mentor of mine online at the time. And, uh, and you know, I, but yeah, I probably could have done a year. And, but I said, it, I said two years. So somehow, you know, that's what it was. But I mean, I feel like goals. Yeah. A 90 day goal is a good now. Like I'm launching, we're launching our membership program now. We're going all in on it. So it's going to be really cool. And it's a paid membership. Yeah, and what, what do a you lot get with that? So you get, it's mainly, it's mainly a, um, a big part of it is the community. So it's around these trips. So people you know, that come in and most of them are people who've been listening for years, but you know, they pay a, a, you know, a good amount of money, not a ton of money, but enough to get in the door. Cause I don't want to make this like a $5 a month, you know, like every other kind of thing out there. This is more like, I want the people that are really into it, but what they get is being able to talk to other people and build trips with other people. The, the idea is how do we help you build your number one best trip this year? And so I'm going to have them in the group talking, but then I'm going to be doing weekly Q and A's. So I'll come on and bring people that want to jump on. Then we'll also bring expert gurus, all these people we're doing trips with. They're going to do seminars and workshops and things like that. And then I'm also going to say, hey, where do you want to go? I want to go up to say they say up to you know Toronto or somewhere around, you know, in Quebec to fish. I'll build a trip for them. And then so it'll be focused for members of the community. So that's the idea. And then there'll probably be some discounts for trips and early access. We'll probably have trips that maybe you can't get unless you're in our group. So like Atlantic salmon is booked out at this lodge, but maybe because we have the connection, we can get you, you know, in. So that's kind of what it is. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be amazing. I've been thinking about this for many years doing this and we've really now we're using circle. It's this great uh, platform for it. And I've just kind of put the time in, but I'm doing this in 90 days. You know, this is like a 90 day sprint. I'm going to launch this thing. And so it's going to be cool. I'm writing that down circle. Yeah. 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 Definitely check circle out. It's uh, really awesome. It's, you know, Facebook groups are great and they work, but it's just, you know, there's so many distractions and circle is just really easy to use. So that's what we're doing. Cool. I've never, I've never heard of it. Um, so what, uh, you know, you, you mentioned part of that package is like helping people basically go out and make a trip happen. What, what, what are some of those freebies you can share with anybody that like has a passion for what they do to, to make sure trips happen. I have an adventure formula that I tell people, uh, where it's like, Hey, you, you, you just have to almost be manic about like making sure it's on the calendar, making sure, you know, there's not too many people that can adjust that, you know, there's a small group and I don't know, there's little rules I share with people, but what's, what's some things you can share to make sure people make the stuff they want to do happen. Yeah. Make it happen. That's a great, I love that. That's, um, I mean, yeah, I think for sure on the calendar, I always like the accountability thing. I think that's really big, you know, because if you tell somebody else or, you know, or you're doing a trip with somebody, right. That's, but that accountability is huge. So if you got something and it could be any goal, really, you know, like you said, say you want to launch a podcast. Well, I set a goal, same thing for anybody listening here. If they want to do that, just put it on the map and then tell, I always go back to the thing. I used to chew tobacco right back in the day. It's been 
Uh, I quit when my first daughter was born. Yeah. So, you know, so Copenhagen was my thing back in the day, but I, but I gave it up. I remember when I quit that it was really hard, but there were a few things that helped me. And one of them was accountability, telling everybody that I'm going to quit because then you got people that like, if they see you and you're like, Hey, what they'll they call you out. So I feel like same thing with a big trip. You know, if you want to do that, you know, hold yourself accountable, get an accountability partner. Right. So that's a big thing. I think the calendar is big. And then I'm a big planner, you know, just having a system set up. So you have, you know, the steps, like if you're going, if the trip is in uh, 30 days or a year, I like to set up a, like a timeline, kind of a, a plan to get there. What do I need to do to get there? Okay. I need to get my passport. I need to do all this stuff. And then just like I'm building out this program, you know, I have this 90 day plan and it's all on a schedule you know, pretty much broken down by week on what I need to do to get there. So, you know, if it's a small trip you're doing, that's easier to do. But if there's a lot of logistics, then I think writing it down, having a spreadsheet, have, so, so you know what's going on is big. And then, you know, and of course, there's going to always be bumps in the road and you got to be able to tweak um, and be flexible and stuff like that. But those would be some big advice, you know, pieces of advice that I give. Uh, also, you know, I have a little bit of a, a, a team that helps me, you know, so I think that, Again, it comes down to that. How do you create these systems that make it easier for you to, to put these things in place? It come, part of it is the sponsorship stuff. I think a lot of people don't realize the value of, of doing, you know, sponsorship and, you know, and all the stuff that goes around that. Mm -hmm. And so part of it, I think a lot of people on, you know, on podcasts think of it just as an ad, an ad read. But yeah. really, sponsorship is all about, you know, engaging your listeners with these great companies. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just an ad read. It's like, like our trips. Right. These trip events are part of our sponsorship program, you know, and that so it's just, that's how that's how sponsorship works when it's working, functioning really great. It, there, yeah, there's this real connection and it's for the long haul and it's just quantity over qual quality over quantity. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to ask you about some of your favorite guests. Uh, it sounds like Yvonne might be one of those. Is there one that might not, you know, be as obvious that that's really stood out to you? It might be recent to me. It's always like one of the most recent because. There's yeah, so totally. many great interviews that it's hard to choose. It is. Yeah. You, and how many are you up to now? What, so what so the well, show, that's a show but yeah. the sh my show, the adventure sports that we're on has a thousand and like 50 episodes. However, however, I took the show over at around episode 400. I was a guest originally. And then oh, wow. I asked the, the host had started the show. They were both kind of entering a phase of life that was, you know, they wanted more adventure. They were, um, gosh, they, they, one wanted to live full time with his family on the road. One wanted to move like really far into the mountains with his yep. family. They, 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 but they needed to quit hosting because of that. And I was, you know, in my twenties still, I was just, just settling down with my wife. And, uh, I, I reached out and said, Hey, if y'all ever need help hosting, let me know. And they were like, well, you just yeah. want to take the show over. <laughs> and so nice. they were like, you know, we've been doing this for four years or so. And, and I've been hosting ever wow. since about five years ago, five, six years ago. Yeah. And so I've done about 600 episodes of my own. So we're, we're you about, have. about similar to you. And are those 600 uh, mostly interview other interview you've interviewed people? Yep, yep. That's it. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. You're doing, you're kicking butt. Two, I, I do two a week, but only one new one a week. The second, it will be a revisited, which I pull from the archives. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I was doing two full time, but now with athletic, I, I haven't been able to do both, but you do three a week. Yeah. Three a week. Jeez, man. That's a lot of, that's a lot of conversations and that's a lot of prep too. Yeah. Uh, you know, and we've, we've said, I've set my program up where it's easier on the prep. So part of it is, yeah. I mean, I, I love the part of the surprise. I do my research, you know, a little bit, but um, so I'm not going, you know, I'm not doing spending hours and hours doing research too, but to answer your question, uh, I mean, we've had lots of like great ones. One that sticks out is uh, the Henry Winkler episode, the Fonz, right. I had him on. Right. And so some of the young people don't probably don't realize the Fonz, but he was, he was this epic happy days, right? The show in the eighties. Yeah. Happy days. So Henry Winkler is a fly fisherman. And, uh, and I had, I, he's a super hard, and I, I've got a couple other big names. I, you know, I probably shouldn't throw them out here, but I've got a couple guests that are coming up that are definitely everybody in the world knows who these guests are. And so those are coming, but um, hopefully actually, let me just say, hopefully those are coming, but Henry was, Henry was huge because I had watched this guy my whole life. And, uh, and I just sat in front of Henry Winkler and asked some questions, some fly fishing, some about happy days and, you know, and everything. It was, it was, it was surreal. I mean, him, I mean, those two, him and Yvonne were definitely sitting there in front of those guys it was crazy. 
are, are were the people you know they say don't meet your heroes but and i'm not saying the yeah. bonds was necessarily your hero but no, it's definitely right. someone you yeah. you admired and watched how, how was he just in person oh he was, he was great yeah he was super awesome he, he was he was very passionate very passionate he had this uh the show out that was out when i did it called barry i'm not even sure if it's still out there but it's this show very, very intense show that he's I, you know he was working on at the time but I asked him at the time when he did Happy Days, he received 500,000 physical letters a day from fans that would come in. 500,000 letters would come in. People saying, oh, my God, they love this guy. Right. That's how, how popular this guy was. A week. Uh, yeah. From all around the world. Right. And so he was he was the biggest name, you know, and so he was just so passionate. And, and, and what he said was I asked him this question, which was pretty cool. I said. I said, Henry, you love fly fishing so much. You, you, you've been doing this. You're 75 years old, whatever it is. I said, why don't you just, why don't you just retire from acting and just fish and just enjoy the rest of your life, right? You just fish for the he said, he said, why would I do that? He said, I'm, I just won an Emmy for Barry. I'm the great, I'm, I'm at the top of my game right now. I, I definitely am loving this life. I, you know, so basically just said, yeah, I mean, he's not going to quit anytime soon because, and you, but you can see the passion. That's what was really cool that came out. You could just feel and see you know the guy and see what he was like that's so cool yeah i mean mean, that's 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 wild to think oh yeah your your star has has risen and now fallen no it's it's still there still going you just won an emmy that's unbelievable wow really cool perspective has there been maybe an aspect of fly fishing or or something about the sport or a location that you just did not see coming like something that really surprised you with a guest maybe it's a location maybe it's a style of fishing or maybe it's just a story that was like i, I can't believe i can't believe i didn't know that right yeah i mean there there's been a lot of those too i'm thinking back um i mean I, we used to try to do a, a every 100 episodes like have the, a great guest you know one of our biggest guests on we did that for a while i mean I had this, I, I guess I'll go back to Frank Moore. I think it was, I can't remember now. I, you probably like you, you forget. I can't remember all these episodes. I used to remember the first 200 episodes. I remember every single one by name and everything, but now I, I kind of forget a little bit, but um, Frank Moore, he was, I think it might've been 400 or somewhere in there, but he was. I see 46 and then I see Frank. Oh no. Wait, wait, yeah. yeah. That's Frank might Moore. Be, and I then can't... you've got another one of Frank Moore at uh 300. Yeah. 300. Yeah. 300. That's it. So yeah. So Frank Moore. So. I think that was the one and um he was this bigger than life guy i mean not only was he a amazing fly angler you know down and for steelhead and he had this amazing lodge i actually did this one in person i don't do most of my interviews in person but i met him in person and i shook his hand and literally the guy almost crushed my hand at the time i think he was 95 and he literally was just this powerhouse but he was bigger than life and i sat down there with him and his wife in his kitchen and we talked and he was a, a conservation champion, which is a big thing for me, right? He was a big person that saved a lot of the, 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 the rivers and streams down that part of the world. But not only that, this guy was in D-Day, literally stormed the beaches of Normandy and was and fought there and came back and survived and led this entire life. So anytime I've never been fought, you know, I've never served or anything like that. But anytime I meet somebody like that, I'm always really, uh, I don't know what the word is, kind of thankful but always uh, just blown away at what they did. I mean, can you imagine being there when people are shooting guns at you and you're trying to come across, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's just, it's, it's a crazy thought, but that's him. And he comes back and he lives this amazing life and he fights for conservation and he's this great person. And so I feel like that one, those types of are always the ones that stick out to me. These old, these people that, you know, and now he passed away, his house burnt down tragically. And then he died, you know, a few years later, but like that's the people I want the podcast to be for. I want people to remember and, and listen to it because of those people that paved the way. Um, how, how has the show changed over the years? You know, it's uh, it's always evolving. I think like any, you know, any business or anything should, right? You've got to always tweak things as you go. I mean, we started out, you know, one episode. I mean, that was one thing when I first started, I said, I'm going to be consistent. We have not missed an episode in over seven years, right? Like every that's one thing, whether it's a holiday, whatever, that Tuesday episode always dropped. And that's always been the case since then we've added, right? So we added two episodes a few years ago and we kept that and, you know, kept three years. So we've added, you know, but I, I think I've probably evolved a little bit, you know, I mean, definitely I hear from listeners. They're like, Dave, you know, you're getting even better. <laughs> you know, they're, they're loving like where we're going. I feel like I'm always trying to talk to the community to say, Hey, where do you want it? Where do you want this to go? And I'm always trying to get feedback for them. So a lot of the episodes we get now are based on listeners who tell me who I should get on in topics. So that's something I'm always doing. That's the reason why the community is going to be even better 
because I'll be able to ask them and they'll help build more of the podcast. Um, you know, those are some little things. I think I, I really think it's been kind of the same formula. I've been, I interview, I have another podcast. It's a marketing podcast. I do. I'm kind of a podcasting, you know, What's so I do, podcast? I've been, it's, it's, it's on the back burner a little bit right now, but it's called the, um, it, at the time it was the outdoors online. It, it's, we've changed the name. So at the time I was interviewing kind of people helping basically the outdoor community build their, their online business. So, but what I did was I interviewed a lot of marketing professionals. So I interviewed uh, the guy, uh, one of the guys that wrote the book. He was a, he was a podcast host for NPR. He's the guy that, well, he was, wasn't a host. He was the guy who cre- created the podcast back in the day for NPR. And, uh, and he wrote this book, which was, um, which was all about, I'm kind of drawing blanks on some of the names here, but he wrote this books on, how, you know, how to be a successful podcaster, right? And this is the guy who basically started podcasting. And he said, the number one thing is to be curious. That's it. You can't fake it. You can't come into thing. And so I've always been naturally curious. And so I've always, so any episode, you know, like today coming in with you, I was super interested to hear, you know, connect with you because I'm curious about, you know, what you do. And there's been all sorts of cool nuggets that have come out. So I feel like, you know, that's been my secret is that I'm curious about fly fishing, just the world. And so I haven't really changed a whole lot. Um, I think the show's gotten better because I have better guests on, you know, and we're more connected to the community, but, um, but yeah, that'd be my take on kind of where we're at. Very cool. No, that's, that's awesome, man. I, I have, uh, there's another, one of my good friends has a, a outdoor industry focused marketing podcast called backcountry marketing, uh, uh Cole Heilborn. We, he's a filmmaker, but he talks to tons of executives from these outdoor companies and it's really, really cool conversations. And, uh, sounds similar to that or it might be similar, but he, he, he it, it was to some cool people. It, it was at the time. I mean, again, that's like anything, you know, you double down on what works and you get rid of what doesn't. And that I was so busy and the wet fly swing was working so great. I was, I just didn't have time to develop, but I had 30 episodes, 30 interviews with some of the leaders in podcasting and kind of marketing. So it's a good little resource, but um, yeah, I'm going to leave it there. If I ever come back and get a little more extra time, maybe another team member, I'll be able to get back into it. I host a, another show called Florida Uncut. That's about conservation topics here. And, uh, and it's, it's, total passion project has been going about six months and one, one episode every two weeks. And yeah, man, that's, it's, 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 I can't, I want to start so many new shows, but it's just time of the day. How, how do you, how do you balance or, or, you know, how do you decide what to move forward with or, or, cause I'm always, I'm always telling, I'm talking to my wife about this all the time. And I think this applies to anybody is my problem or is my challenge getting more efficient or is my challenge to get rid of things that I'm currently doing? Like, can I just, get into endlessly efficient at what I'm doing so I can add more that I want to do, or should I just be happy and content with the amount of things I have to do and the way I'm doing them? How do, how do you figure that out? Yeah, I think efficiency for sure is part of it. You know, I think you have to get more efficient and, you know, cut things that, you know, aren't working as well. You know, I think again, it comes back to having a system in place to figure out what, what you cut and what you don't, you know, and I think that the team has been my thing that I've, didn't have. And I slowly have built up because I knew that I couldn't do what I wanted to do without having some support. So that's been a big part of it, you know, and, and, you know, it's not perfect, right. There's still a lot of work. We have a ton of work to do, but it's gotten us to a place where I can focus on, you know, like right now I don't do any editing. Right. And I love editing. That's one of my favorite things, right. I love editing, but I don't do any editing anymore. That that's all, that's all been transferred. Is that scary? Um, uh, You know, it was at the time. But now what you realize is that if somebody most you could hire somebody and they can do maybe they're 80 percent at your level or maybe higher, but 80 percent at your level, you know, with, you know, a person or two is going to help you do some other great things. And that's the thing that's allowed us to do to create this travel program and to do stuff just like email. Right now, I'm struggling with email. I've got thousands of I can't even tell you how many unopened emails I have, but it's it's thousands. And so I'm trying to transfer this task into my assistant so that she can take over all email. So I don't have to look at email anymore. So I literally just come in and she says, here's, here's your top emails. Here's what you need to work. Everything else has been, you know, pushed away or whatever. So that's, that's one of those things where think how much time you spend on email, right? All of us, it's crazy. And so if you could get efficient at transferring that, or maybe there's some, um, some tool you could pay to do, to, you know, take care of it, like, boom. I mean, like, I'm just learning about HubSpot. It's a marketing, you know, it's like a CRM. 
it's amazing like what it tra- it tracks everything it has all these automations that pop up and systems and stuff like that stuff you know you can do a lot you can save a lot of time and do a lot more if you learn those things so that's kind of where i've gone but i know there's other other ways to do it all right uh, i just got a couple more questions as you have you've ramped up to do th- three episodes a week that is just insane to me um that's a lot of work that's a lot of conversations have you found your love of fly fishing like deep in or you know that you can also i don't know get burned out a little bit how, how have you fight fought burnout as you focus wholly on the thing you love yeah i i have not burned out at all it's definitely increased because what it's increased is all these opportunities that i've interviewed so you know i'm realizing like wow i can go down to you know wherever and so now my trips that I want to go on are exponential and, and I will never get to all of them. So it's actually increased my love because <laughs> like saltwater, I was never into saltwater, you know, prior to doing this, but now I'm like, man, I want to do it all. I want to go, you know, tarpon. I want to go catch a permit, like all these bonefish, all these species. So that's where, it, and then, and then I love the travel too. You know, I think the travel we're doing a, we're doing a road trip with the family from Oregon across to Wisconsin. That's part of our thing this, this summer we're going to be doing so we're, we're going to have the camper on the back. We're going to be cruising across, stopping, you know, just doing a family thing. And then we're going to meet up and, you know, we have some family in, in uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin. So I feel like it's actually improved. I, I'm not the type of guy that's on the water. And it's like, I have to catch the biggest fish or I have to catch the most fish. But I will tell you when we were in Virginia and we did our trip, um, our trip with the Mossy Creek fly shop. I mean, I had this epic moment where I caught this massive fish. It was, it felt like it was, once in a lifetime, the way it all worked down and how the fly all came together and, it, and the fish took it. And so I feel like those moments, um, I don't do as much fishing now, but the moments I get are way more elevated. Mm, that understanding that depth is there and, and you, you probably appreciate the heck out of them now too. So that makes a difference. Um, you know, why should someone add fly fishing to their repertoire of, of, adventure sports what what is it what 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 can you get in fly fishing that that really no other sport offers yeah wow that's i mean that's the perfect uh the perfect question i mean i think it is that's cool thing because we talked about the meditative and you're in this moment and fly fishing can be anything you want it to be but there is this huge adventure right i mean i've talked to you know people that have been on the show um you know um jeff courier He's caught over 400 species around the world. And he's this guy everybody knows. He's traveled around the world trying to hit every species that he can on a fly. And so he's got over 400. He's, he's got these stories from, you know, wherever in the world. <clears throat> he told me this one story is in Africa and he was on this bus trying to go to this fishing spot. And, and somebody, you know, I, I can't remember how the whole story went down. But he's on this bus. Some guy jumped the window and was like trying to take over the bus. And it was like this scary moment. But like those extreme things obviously are kind of extreme, but it's the adventure. Like that's fly fishing is uh, as much about the adventure. Like fishing is, to be honest, is secondary a lot of times, right? With your travels, you're out there, you're on this thing. I love the travel. I love hearing people's story because that stuff happens. Or somebody's like, oh, I met this, I was in this village and we met these amazing, this amazing family and they took me in and we stayed there for a week. Or the guy I talked to in, in uh, down in Honduras, he built that out of a, he's like a one man show, just creating this thing in Honduras, which is this new fly fishing lodge. And he's so, so passionate about it. But he went there because he went to Honduras for, first, not for fly, but just to go there and experience Honduras. And so I think that that's I think that that's what fly fishing is. When you're on the water and you're doing this perfect cast or and you catch this fish and it's this magical moment, that's the icing on the cake. Like everything else that built up to that, you know, the learning of the bugs and the entomology and learning about the streams and the fish and the conservation, and you know, all that that's fly fishing. And I think a lot of times when you go out and you're just fishing. And you're just going out to kill a bunch of fish. That's fine. You know, count. I love eating fish, like I said, but I think sometimes it loses the magic of what it's all about. We're out there for the adventure, for the connection to nature, to the natural environment. And, and sure, I'll, I'll definitely kill a steelhead or, you know, a fish if it's legal to do sometimes. But a lot of times I'm just out there for, for nature. You know what I mean? So that's, that's, I think that's why fly fishing, I think has this really cool, I won't even say it's just different. I think it's just different because that's why people are here. We, we, we run into that a lot. You know, people plan an adventure thinking what, like if you, if you could imagine, take your mind to after the trip, what are the event, what are the stories you're going to be telling about this trip? It is never net. What you end up telling is never anything you could imagine. 
going into the trip. You just, the variables, the things like that, you know, you, uh, people trying to steal the bus that you're on, like that's something you could never, never, never plan for. And that's why it's so important to just go because the things you end up loving and the things you end up, you know, bonding over the things you, the stories you end up telling, you you can't even imagine what those are going to be at this point because it's going to be so random and so wild. Um, well, how about you? What, what, what's one of the more unexpected things that's happened to you on a river? I'm sure animal encounters yeah. or um, oh, man. stuff stuff floating by you didn't expect. I mean, there's oh, probably we, been some wild situations. We've had so many river, <laughs> crazy rivers. I mean, you know, if I had a narrow one, I, I guess I like, you, you know, go back to the most recent thing. Um, you know, we did this, tri- we've done this trip since I was a little kid. It's, we call it the cast and blast or whatever, but it's a, it's a, we float the river. Uh, we float the, the Deschutes river. And then we, we also do some hunting down there and stuff like that. Right. It's this, and so we fish for steelhead and we do some hunting, but I had this thing where I took the family this year for the first time, like as a, usually it's this guy's trip and things like that. But I went down with my family, you know, Megan, myself and my two kids, 10 and 12. And, and it was, but it was all about hunting. Like we want to get a deer. And so we went up there and did this epic trip and, uh, you know, I had this amazing deer I was able to get brought down, but Megan had never shot a deer and she was using, you know, my, my other rifle. And she had this moment where she was up there on her own and I didn't, I wasn't even there, but she literally got her first buck. Right. And it was this amazing moment because once you get these animals, it's not just like, Oh, throw them in the car. You have a full day's hiking of getting them up and down these mountains where we're hiking and it's in the desert. So we had this whole moment of this whole process, you know, it took the whole day to get them down in the heat. Amazing. The kids, by the way, are 10 and 12 on the banks of a giant river. And we left them there at camp all day long. So one of the greatest things about this was the fact that we now can trust our kids to be safe on their own along the river. So that's like as much of the take home. But once we got these deer down, you know, to camp and hung them and did all that stuff, we were just sitting back in the shade, having a beer. And just looking back and every time that happens, I look back and just think like, man, that was the most work I've ever done in my entire life, but I'm so happy. I just did it, you know, and the next day I couldn't even walk because I was so sore from dragging the deer down the hill and stuff. So that moment, you know, was around the river and we've got lots of stories, but that one will stick out probably forever for me. Dude, that's, that's like a scene from 200 years ago. Yeah, that is, it is leave the kids on the river and who shot the deer again. Uh, so Megan got one. I got one. We got two. We got two bucks. Yeah. And she shot it across the canyon, like a long shot all the way across. And she literally shot it. And, you know, what happens when you get a good shot, the animal disappears because it just drops. So she literally was like, well, did I get it? Went over there. But yeah, again, it's we're doing that again this year come October. And I'm excited. I'm super wow. excited for it. And that's that's absolutely epic. And, uh, you know, the fact that I mean, that that's that's like a painting, paint, uh, you know, it's a scene from a film. But I've been upside down in white water. I've, I've been floating through, you know, I've been in doing five day trip and flip my boat upside down and been yard sale and seen all of our gear floating down. I've had some really crazy <laughs> situations too. Right. So it's, uh, you know, the water is amazing because the water is like my, of course you're around it for fishing, but I've done some white water trips to get to fishing areas that have been so epic that I'm just like, wow, I survived that. And it's, it's, it's awesome. I'm here to tell the story. You know, it sounds like you, you've had this life filled with adventure. Um, however, you still have, have taken the, even though you grew up around this, you have taken these risks and taken these uh, kind of jumps into something new, which is like starting the show and, and guiding these trips and, and, and building this this brand, this, this community. Let's say it's a community. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. What, what is, I don't know, what, what are some things that you can share quickly advice for folks that might be, you know, you... 10 years ago when they were just starting to think about this stuff and like, how, how do I make this happen? A- anything you've learned yeah. that said, make sure these are in place before you get started. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think we've talked about a, a lot of it. I mean, you know, having support, having an accountability, whether that's a mastermind group, you know, right. You can find other people that are trying to have the same goal as you, <laughs> but that accountability is huge. And being able to throw ideas off people and get feedback is huge because there's going to be a lot of things in business. The thing about business is it's always changing podcasting, it's all going to change. Nothing's going to be the same in five years. You know, when I started in 2017, I remember starting thinking like, wow, I'm late to the game. I'm, how am I going to do this? Twenty seven. Everybody's already a podcaster, right? But at the time, right, it was still fairly early. <laughs> but, you know, things have changed now. And right. And so now video is getting you know, more important. Social media is changing. <laughs> but I think going back to invest in yourself, 
always is probably the biggest thing that's elevated where I was. I was at some point struggling. And when I started paying coaches and people to help me elevate where I was, that's when I started getting traction because instead of making all those mistakes, I actually had somebody come here and say, Hey, you don't have to make these mistakes. Here's, here's how you can do it. And so I've spent thousands, thousands and thousands of dollars on, on coaching. And I'm just still will, and I'll still keep spending it because I know that it pays back, you know, 10 X or, or more, uh, you know, on, on what you do. So I think that's the number one for people out there to get accountability and don't be afraid to spend money. Well, that's, maybe it's just a course, maybe it's something, you know, but spend money because again, it's going to save you. Your, your learning curve is going to be way super lower because you're going to have people helping you along the way. You don't want to try to do this on your own podcasting. You can start a podcast. Anybody can do it. It's easy, but to stay in it for the long time, the long game and make a business out of it, you need help for sure. And so find some help. That's my biggest advice. When I took over this show, part of, part of the transition was basically coaching on how to run the show. And there are so many things that I, I will thank Kurt and Travis, the former hosts to the, the day I die for just showing me the ropes. Cause it was, there were so many moments I thought I would never have thought of this on my own. I would have never learned this on my own. Uh, no, it, it would have taken five years, you know, 10 years for, to, for me to get to this point. But because of that experience, they could just show me right now, here's how you do that. And that, that saved me five years of time. Like it's, it's so worth it. Um, last question and I'll let you go. Uh, anyone interested in getting into fly fishing? I know this is where your passion is, is, is helping grow this sport and helping people, uh, uh, advance in this sport. What's your, what's the first things they can do? I mean, I, I'd assume find somebody that can help teach them some some of the yeah. sport first. I mean, that's part of, like we said, invest in yourself. I think with fly fishing, if you have some, you know, extra money, you know, paying a guide is definitely the number one thing that a lot of, a lot of our guests have mentioned, you know, of course not everybody has the money to spend on a guide right away. So having somebody to get started, whether that's like we said, a group, you know, I'll have a link out at wetflyswing.com slash ASP. And I'll have a little link there with some getting started information. There's a little podcast I did with some tips and things like that, but there's a, you know, you got to get a fly rod, you got to get some certain things, which again, a lot of people think it's really expensive. You can get into this fairly cheap, you know, if you don't have a fly rod, you know, a couple hundred bucks, you can get a whole outfit, but a lot, it seems overwhelming because it's like, where do I start? So the number one thing is if you have a local fly shop in your area, I'd recommend going there. So you can just search on your phone, fly shop, fly fishing shop. There's these local fly shops all around the country, drop in there and ask them, say, Hey, how do I get started? And they'll help you. That's one big thing. Again, Go on Facebook. There's groups out there that can help search your area. A lot of times there's a specific group in your area. Um, there's a lot of resources out there and it seems overwhelming. But again, if anybody has questions, they can reach out to me, Dave at wetflyswing.com. And I always leave it open that if anybody reaches out to me and has a question, not only will I will answer the question, but I'll put together a podcast episode for them if they reach out. So I'm always trying to get new ideas. So if anybody wants to, to send me an email, um, I'll do that. But that's awesome. Yeah, I, I think, that, I think you, that, so. Those aren't the thousands of unopened emails questions. No, yeah, no, no, those aren't. Those are not. That's a good question. <laughs> but keep it simple. Keep keep it simple is the thing. I think the mantra is perfect. Don't don't feel like you have to get everything. Waiters and boats. Like literally, you can just go get a fly rod, or even get a guide if you want, and they have the gear for you, and they can take you out on the just, water just and show you how to it it. Borrow, borrow it. Yeah, yeah, just try it out. See if you like it, or find a friend right? Maybe there's somebody, you know, or, you know, there's all sorts of reasons. So, so start simple, keep it simple. Don't feel like you have to get everything and then just try it. And if you like it, that's, you know, you take the next step, but, but keep it simple starting yeah. out and find someone who has that coaching mindset that they, cause there's a lot of sports that do have that air of like unapproachability. I think those are just the right individuals in that sport. Cause the right, the person, the real advocate for any of these sports or any of these hobbies and passions is, going to want to invite others in. So find who that person is and they're going to make it so easy for you to, exactly. to, to, to learn. So and Dave, yeah. this is awesome. Thank you so much. I, I got yeah. a lot I can learn from you, man. This is yeah, really Mason. Cool. No, this has been great. I appreciate you having me on here. I think, like I said, it's, it's awesome. You have a great show. I love what you have going. I'm definitely going to be following up with that next episode you have uh, with, uh, with Lance and everything <laughs> you have going. So yeah, thanks for having me on. First of all, Thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. 
And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.